call this joint meeting of the Williamsburg James City County School Board, Williamsburg City Council, and James City, oops, excuse me, excuse me, James City County um, Board of Supervisors to order. If you can hear me, sorry about that. And as we do, if I can have Miss Aller call the roll for the school board. Miss Cook. Here. Miss Hummel. Here. Mrs. Hunley. Here. Mrs. Ortigo. Here. Mrs. Young. Here. Mr. Dell. Here. Thank you. Mayor Ponce. Uh, good evening. Thank you. Um, first, I, I think we need to approve the virtual. Or do I just call it order? Call the order. Uh, Drew, would you call the meeting to order, please? Uh, sure. Call the roll. Mr. Rogers. Here. Ms. Ramsey. Here. Mayor Ponce. Here. Vice Mayor Dent. Here. And we have uh, Mr. Maslin virtual, so we'll need a motion to approve him participating virtually. So moved. Second. Mr. Rivet. <coughs> Mr. Rogers? Aye. Ms. Ramsey? Aye. Mayor Pond? Aye. Vice Mayor Dent? Aye. Thank you. And I'll call the meeting of uh, the uh, James City County Board of Supervisors to order uh, for the purpose of a joint meeting with the City Council and the School Board. Uh, Mr. Stevens, call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Here. Mr. Hippel? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. McLennan? Here. We uh, have uh, Ms. Sadler uh, here remotely. Uh, I'd ask for a motion to include her electronically in this meeting. So moved. Ms. Stevens, call the roll, please. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. Mr. McLennan? Aye. Welcome, Ms. Sadler. <coughs> yes, good morning. Thank you. Thank you all. It's great, again, great to be with you. And uh, before we head into this meeting, I just want to say we've had the school system, the school division, with the leadership of Dr. Heron here, we've just had a fantastic first start of this 22-23 school year. And I just do want to thank everybody that's in this room that's had a hand in your various respects uh, to make that happen. So thank you all. Uh, we're moving on to our uh, state budget uh, conversation. I appreciate Mr. Trivet inviting Mr. Regenball to this meeting. Thank you, sir, for being here. And uh, Mr. Reginball is going to give us uh, an idea of our state budget and the implications for our K-12 public education as it re relates to our school division. Thank you, Mr. Reginball. Oh, thank you. Uh, let's see. Is this working? Yep. Maybe I have to show me how this works. Is it working okay? Yeah, good morning. How you doing, everyone? Um, yeah, Andrew. Uh, I actually talked to, I, I think, Jim and, and John at the VACO conference. They gave me a little heads up, and then Andrew got a hold of me on, on Monday. Um, so I, I did my best putting something together for this meeting this morning, but uh, uh, give me a little dispensation. So I, I, I hope this uh, gives you a little, a, a broader perspective on what's going on with your uh, school, combined school division funding and where the state sort of stands in that and what some of the prospects might be going forward for you. I know you got some big decisions and you're talking about capital outlay, things like that. You know, of course, ongoing operational funding is always important. Um, what I wanted to first do is, is give you a, a little sense over time of what your revenues have looked like. So I've got Williamsburg on the left, James City. Sorry about all the numbers. But basically what it shows you is that through 21, and I know things have changed some, this was kind of up to the pandemic, um, that <coughs> really you, you haven't been keeping pace your revenues, on, at least, especially on a per capita basis with inflation. So if you add inflation and population growth together, you know you're, you're up over 40% over that time frame, 09 to 21. And you can see Williamsburg's uh, per capita are actually negative through that. And I know that some of that's changed. Your meal, that was a kind of a low water mark year for Williamsburg. I know your meals taxes, your transient occupancy, and you, both of your real estate taxes have grown a lot since 21. So things have changed, but you gotta remember, inflation has also grown a lot since 21. In fact, that's when it really started to kick into place. And uh, of course, the Federal Reserve's trying to combat that now, but we've got an inflationary environment and so I don't think there's any chance that on a per capita basis your revenues over time have been keeping pace with population inflation growth. You could even throw ADM and, and you know, inflation as well. Um, so that's the, and this gives you, you can look at this later, this gives you sort of the major revenue sources, what they were in 09, and then kind of look at them what they are now. Um, you know, Williamsburg, again, uh, you know, you relied, you know, your growth and trend and meals has not been what it was prior to. So we, I think you both know that. Uh, so this gives you a little look at um, your local property tax rates, what they were sort of 
right after the last recession and what the current rates are. So they have gone up, and your, your surrounding localities, they've gone up as well. You know, real estate rates have gone up. And then you can look at what the comparing your median household income, that's the, the uh, uh, Census Bureau's numbers for 2020, uh, median household income, that, that, that's not gross, that's just sort of the median to give you an idea of how you look. And you see Williamsburg, you know, noted as a, as a wealthy locality, but you kind of have the low end of what the median household income is. You got the low income people and high income people. So the median, interestingly stuff, I know this isn't you, I looked at New Kent County, they went from pretty low to pretty high pretty quick. A lot of, a lot of wealthy people moving into New Kent, so things can change. Uh, in that, you know, James City has a pretty high median um, uh, household income. And then I threw in the Zillow index, it's sort of pre-pandemic to now, and of course, as you all know, and here's some data to support it, you know, you're getting that 30 to 40% growth in, in ho house prices on average throughout the region. And so that's also affected, of course, I'm sure your real estate taxes. And that's why I said that previous table, um, those numbers for real estate, I'm sure have gone up, you know, what you're collecting in real estate taxes. Now, th this next slide gives you the change in your local composite index uh, for both Williamsburg and James City. And so the, the most recent, and this is the current, they're using 2019 data. And I was, you, you realize how dated the data is that goes into the current composite index. So the base year data, other than ADM, which is more, more recent, that, that would be 21 ADM, is it, for the 22-24 biennium is actually 2019 base data. It takes that long, for example, for income tax data to, to come in, and so for them to do their analysis of, of the true value of real estate, so they have to use base data that's quite old when you go into this. And so you, you might have an idea, you can't really get a great idea of what you're gonna be in the next biennium, uh, because you gotta know what every other locality is doing too. It's how you compare to every other locality. And that's why I put this in terms of your percent of the state. That's how it's really done. And so if, go, go to the numerator weighted average and the denominator weighted average of these five factors, three in the numerator, two in the denominator, and you can kind of see how you've changed over time. And what it, what it shows you, let's take Williamsburg first. Their numerator, which is supposed to be the proxy for their, for their wealth, okay, that's the numerator. You know, income, true value of real estate, sales taxes, that's the numerator. It's gone down over time. And when it goes down, your composite index goes down. Now, when you go to the denominator, that's the population component and two-thirds ADM, one-third population. We can see that Williamsburg stayed kind of the same. And so, because they've stayed the same denominator, the percent of state, their composite index has been coming down because their wealth has been coming down. It has an offset. Then go to James, city county what's happened there is basically their numerator is, is bounced around but it stayed relatively the same you know their percent of the state's wealth okay it stayed the same but you've grown in terms of your population and adm school population relative to the state and that's why the composite is coming down slightly for for james city so you can kind of tell in your mind what's going to happen there i heard right before this meeting that you're expecting not much growth in, in, in school population. That is actually the most important factor in the LCI. The single most important factor is your school population. And if you're, if you're gonna stay the same relative to the state, you probably, you probably um, won't be coming down anymore. Okay, if you're, if you're not growing, if you're not, if you're not getting larger, if the denominator gets larger, then your composite index comes down. You got more kids, your LCI goes down. Well, if it stops going up relative to the state, then your LCI is not going to come down anymore, probably. Okay, that's how you can kind of think about that. Um, and that's, of course, in reflected. Your LCI is reflected in what you get from the state and your required local match. And that's what this shows you. This shows you the the, the <coughs> private, all the the state aid funding accounts. <coughs> Okay, and the SOQ is the primary one, the standards of quality, they call, those are the mandatory accounts that everyone gets money, you, ha you have to match it based on your LCI. Now, of course, every locality overmatches, they put more in than what they're required, but this is the requirement, and it also determines how much you get from the, from the state through that LCI. 
And because you have higher LCIs, you can see that your matches are actually more than what you're getting from the state, your match requirement. So that it affects, the LCI obviously is a huge you know, reason how much you get from the state. You can, the only one that really, the major categories that don't require an LCI is the sales tax distribution based on school age population, that second category there. There's no LCI applied to that, you, you, you know, directly. Actually, there's an indirect application because of the way it affects the basic aid. Couldn't put that in there, but there is an indirect, indirect effect. And then the incentive accounts and, and, and it, it's things like the at-risk add-on. It's, it's, it's reading, it's the, it's the Virginia Preschool Initiative. That's all in that incentive account, okay, down there. It's not mandatory, but every locality takes advantage of that. that you're gonna take all that money and you're gonna match it, okay, because you want the money, but it's not required. So uh, how do you look in terms of what you overmatch those requirements? And so I sh I'm showing you the overmatching of the standards of quality accounts, okay? That's the easiest thing to, to really look at. And you can see James City, you know, overmatches by 100, over 100%, you know, what you're required to put in there. And, and I understand, you know, Williamsburg, there's a funding formula and that's why they look low like that. So really that's, that's all impacted by the funding formula you guys decided here. So it's not really that relevant in this case, Williamsburg. But look at the bottom part of the slide. It's the over 100%. It's 31 localities, so you're one of 31 in James, James City, but those 31 are all basically the large localities, the Arlington's, the Fairfax's, you know, they all, the, you know, the Henrico's, they all, not, well, maybe not Henrico, but most of the large ones. So you can think of it this way. Yes, there's all these medium-sized, smaller ones. I'm gonna show you another slide. It's not all, not all of them, but if you took in total what localities overmatch, it's about 100%. If you took the, not the media, not the, ad, not the, not each individual, but you just threw them all into one big pot, everyone, it's about 100%. So you're kind of right there, okay? Now look at your, I want you to look at your uh, couple things. This is over time, what your overmatch has been. So, you know, seven, eight years ago, six, seven years ago, you were, and, and 21 is the latest data I had. They have to do a report every year to the General Assembly that compares all localities. The last one was done in January of 22, so the next one will be coming out in a month or so, and I'll give you 22 data, so, but I don't have that yet, so I couldn't show it to you. You can see, you know, you've been hovering around 100% for quite a while in James City. Now compare it to, and I wanted to look at what, how you guys overmatch compared to, not this sort of state average or what the, that report shows, but really what your peer localities are doing. And so I, I said, okay, I want to look at those localities, school divisions by size and LCI. And these are the only ones I could really find that were like James City all, in all of Virginia. Hanover, Albemarle, Fauquier, and Powhatan that had similar size school districts and similar LCIs. That was as close as I could get to you guys in James City. So even Powhatan, you know, quite a bit smaller, but I mean, there, there's no other comparable localities in size and LCI. They're either much bigger or they have way different LCIs than you, okay? <coughs> so that's as close as I could get. And you can see the only one that really more overmatches is Albemarle, okay, than you guys. You know, Hanover and Fauquier, Powhatan, they're, they're actually less than James City. And then I, I, I just threw in your surrounding localities. Um, you could see a couple of them are similar size, you know, to a certain degree, York, certainly similar size, but way smaller LCI. So it's not really similar to you in terms of your overmatch. See, they all don't overmatch that requirement, that state requirement to, to put money into your school system. And you. Now, this was a little surprising <coughs> to me. Again, I showed you this last time, this slide, but I updated it to 2021, the latest data I have. And again, it shows uh, the combined school district really hasn't grown much in, um, in, in pay. Now, you have to tell me if this is accurate. This is what is in the superintendent's annual report. I pulled it from Matt, the superintendent's annual report for all instructional positions, which includes principals, as I say in the bottom, all you know, teachers, principals, guidance counselors, et cetera, and really hadn't grown much at all, the, your average pay in, in the combined school district. And you compare that to, uh, take a look at Newport News, you know, from 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2009 at 50,000, 
They're now at 61,000 new for news, according to, again, according to the superintendent's <coughs> annual report. Now, just a few brief statistics. You know, they aren't counting free lunch students anymore. Um, through, after the pandemic, you know, basically they threw that out for a while saying everyone's going to get free lunch, I guess. And they did show something, and I put it in the bottom. Um, they, they call it identified student percentage eligibility now for, for 22 and showed your combined school have a 28.8 percent, you know, free lunch eligibility. So you kind of stayed the same as 20. It hadn't changed that much. I know the state is, is well over 40% free lunch, so you're still well below the state in terms of that. Um, <coughs> students with disabilities continue to grow. The, the state's website did have good data uh, in the current school year for that, the, the current 2023 school year, 22-23, um, and you can see it continues to grow, and particularly autism continues to grow. Um, I was thinking about, well, I won't say this. I was, I was at a dinner last night, and uh, people, I, I was with some, some uh, dentists, and they were telling me some strange things going on in school these days. So I'm sure you guys have your hands full <laughs> a lot of stuff, so don't need to go into that. Uh, homeless, interesting. Maybe you can comment on this, but I guess the pandemic, I'm not sure why these statistics on the state website, they now show there was a significant drop in homeless students in your school district. This is what's coming out of that, you know, the web, you know, same website I got for the, disability, significant drop. So let's talk a little bit about um, what the state situation is right now. Uh, the, I gave a presentation to, to VACO a couple weeks ago at their conference, and I did one earlier to VM, VML and, and VAS, the uh, school superintendents, and I was predicting quite a bit more of state <coughs> revenue uh, for this biennium than they expected. You realize they've had 14% growth in, in fiscal 22, 16% I mean, in 21, 16% in fiscal 22. There was a surplus of 1.9 billion plus at the end of 22 uh, compared to what was in the budget. Um, they now are going to, so that, some of that money is available still. And I, there's 900 million of that the General Assembly is gonna have available. But what, and I was expecting a reforecast of revenues to provide significant revenues. I didn't really want to say how much. I knew it was going to be a lot. But the money committee staff for both the House and the Senate had their retreats last week. And they said two to three billion dollars in extra <coughs> revenues forecast for this biennium. So there's going to be a significant amount of money available for the, for the governor in his introduced budget and for the General Assembly to propose tax reduction, more tax cuts, new spending, maybe, you know, we don't know if it's going to be ongoing spending he proposes, whether it be one time or the general, you know, the general assembly's got the final say. Um, yeah, I worked for the Senate Finance Committee for 12 years, a long time ago, and pretty familiar with how that works. So the general assembly's base is really in charge of, of the money. The governor has got a big say. I mean, he's got his ways of twisting arms, too. So there'll be a give and take. There's a Democratic Senate, a Republican House. I thought they did a pretty good job in coming together. It took them a while, but they had a pretty good budget last time uh, at, the, at the end of June. So they've shown they can work together. There will be a compromise. There's going to be a lot of money. That's always harder in some ways, deciding how to spend money. Um, like I say, they've got to have two to three billion. That's after that's after the identified high priority mandatory spending that they have to do, which isn't that much, actually, this time. Um, they've saved some money on Medi Medicaid compared to what they thought they were going to have to do. So the state is in great, in great shape. Um, they've got a huge pile of reserves right now. They've been putting money into the reserves, which is it's like 15% of the general fund. They've gotten reserves. And then they've been putting money, even extra money, beyond the contribution rates. They put a billion dollars in, in this last uh, last two sessions into the VRS trust fund. So they're strengthening the teacher pool. At some point, they decided not to lower the rates this biennium, even though the board board recommended reducing it 2%. So they're still getting rid of any unfunded liabilities, yes, but they're moving it up pretty rapidly. Um, that will translate into lower rates for you, which localities will welcome, because that's pretty expensive to use you know, those contribution rates to VRS for your, for your employees. So that should help uh, down the road by strengthening the VRS trust fund. 
So the bottom line is the state's got money this session if they want to, to provide more aid for K-12. Um, this chart sort of shows you through 21, again, um, it's, it's, it's difficult for me in a short period of time to go to the last few years, but you, you can see the growth rates in 09 and the, the fundings for you, for your combined school district, where you got your money. Now, the feds have put even more money in 22, 23. So these are gonna change. We, I need to, we need to keep updating this because there's some pretty important years here, 22 and 23, to show in these charts. Um, but I wanted to show you this. And so this is the nominal and real uh, state funding that has either actual or is in the current budget. And, and what though that 23 and 24 show you is what they adopted this General Assembly in, in, in their budget. All, now in the next chart, I'll show you sort of why it jumped up here. But you can see that 23 and 24 changed a lot for people. The state put a lot of money into K-12 last session. And the next, I'm gonna, so here, it, but in real terms, it's not as much. You know, you start reducing it by inflation. Yes, it's up. But if you go back to 22, the third bar in, it really is not, it's really still, it was really still for you guys below what it was in 09 because of inflation, you know, and the growth in your numbers of students. So they're not, they're nominal dollars, the money they're putting in, if you actually take it on a per capita real basis, it doesn't look that great. But this last, the current year and this year, there was a lot of money put in. So finally, the real dollars are more and what you got back in 09. And like I said just briefly a second ago, there's the ability to put even more in this biennium if they want to. So what did they do last session? Well, they did 5% salary increases this year. And you can see the biennium dollars they put in for that. They had to offset that reduction in, the, in that half cent um, sales tax that was being generated from food and hygiene products. That's about, on average, about 18% of, uh, of the sales tax base. So it ended up being, um, you know, a half year and then a year. So it's about $260 million a year that cut across the state, cutting that tax in. So they offset it in the biennium uh, with general fund monies. They removed partially the support cap. They removed about a third of that support cap that they did in 2009, so there's still a ways to go if they're going to, to actually provide the money they used to provide you 13 years ago for your, all your support positions, because they, they, they put a cap in to save money during that recession in 2009-2010, and it was supposed to be temporary. Well, it wasn't temporary. They finally started to remove that. That's something, that's somewhere they could continue to go to with this new money, is getting rid of that support cap, okay? Um, they increased the at-risk add-on tremendously, you can see that. And I don't know if you know how that works, but it depends on the number of free lunch students you have and their concentration. So a, a local, and they, they take that percentage, it's now 36% in this biennium budget. And if you're a Petersburg and you're 100% free lunch kids essentially, every kid in your school district gets a 36% bump in basic aid. That's how that works. If you're a Falls Church and you have almost no free lunch kids, you get a 1% boost in basic aid. And so there's an interpolation between one and 36%, depending on your concentration, times the number of kids. Does that make sense? That's how that, that works, that, that address add-on. So you guys are at the lower end of the free lunch, so you don't get as big a boost. Remember why we looked, back, we looked at that, the average is 40% around the Commonwealth, you were about 28%, so you don't get as quite a big boost. But they did raise it like crazy, and they put some other things in. They, they boosted the VPI, the preschool initiative, to give you a payment per kid. And, you know, for example, and you're a member of First Cities, they've been working on that for years, bumping that up, getting the at-risk add-on up, all that. You know, so that's, a lot of that's been done. I mean, I'll give you an example. That, that at-risk add-on, if you go back about six years, that was only 12%. It went from like 12% to 36% really quickly. And, you know, that's supposed to help those school divisions with lots of, lots of kids that are economically disadvantaged. That's the intent of that. So what happened with another big item? The, one of the reasons why that boosted up at 23 and 24, the state aid, is because they put $850 million into school construction. 
Now, I know you know this pretty well. It sounds like a lot to people, but there's a backlog of at least that they identified themselves, Jay Lark, I mean, they're, they're not Jay Lark, but they're the committee they, they put together, which did a really good job, this modernization committee. They identified at least 25 billion, at least a minimum, in school construction needs around the state. So 850 million is still a drop in the bucket for that. That's another place they could put some of that additional money. If they want to not do it on an ongoing basis, they want to say, well, we're worried about a recession, you know, in, in the next year, and we're worried about our revenues dropping off a cliff. You know, we're only going to do one-time spending. Here's a place they could put more money, drop it into that, the school construction fund. And you can see there's two parts to it. The first part was a program um, that you can get either 10, 20 or 30 percent of a project cost up to 100 million. You got to apply for it. You know, I don't know exactly how they're going to distribute that when they get, you know, and it's 10 or 20 percent. But let's say they get 25 billion in requests. Well, you're not going to be able to do 10 and 20, 30 percent, even you know that. So you're going to have to figure out a way. The state's going to have to figure out how to parcel that out. But it's interesting here because James City, the, the two factors are your LCI, which. If you have a high L, I mean a low LCI, you're, you're, I mean, uh, yeah, a low one, or your high fiscal stress, you can get that 30%. Well, James City has neither. You have a high LCI, meaning that you're supposed to be fairly wealthy, and you have a above average, you have a below average fiscal stress. Again, not stress. That only, so you're only going to get 10% of any project cost if you apply for that. But Williamsburg, interestingly, has a high LCI but an above average fiscal stress ranking. And it's because it's a different measure than the, than the compound. And that's a whole different presentation about why that, okay? <laughs> I've had to do that before about the composite index. There's some strange things in the composite index. Um, but you have 20%. You would have qualified for 20%. So I don't know how they're gonna do that since you're a combined school district. I do know that the school construction grant, the 400 million, the second part of the money they put in, they've got you listed in their, their their, um, I, I, what am I going to call this? Their, their, um, their calc tools at DOE, which I use to get all this data. The, their official, their official designation of how you're going to get what money, how much money for each of those programs I showed you. They show that James City is going to get 2.8 million, which each school division is supposed to get one million dollars. And then the rest, so there's 134 of them. So that's 134 million out of the 400 is, de is designated. A million for each. No matter what, Fairfax gets a million. Lee County gets a million. They all get a million base, which is, you know, okay, you can debate that one. And then the rest of that pot, that, you know, 260 or whatever it is, million left, gets divvied up by your share of the state's ADM, your school population, okay? So it's one million each, and then the rest of it gets split up by ADM. So that gives, James City, 2.8 million out of that pot. But it gives kids Williamsburg 1.1 million, even though they're way smaller, because they get the 1 million base plus their share of the ADM. So you guys kind of do well because you're combined, at least to what they're showing, because Williamsburg kind of gets a bigger boost. You know, they get this small locality, 1 million base here. And that's what they're showing, so I'm assuming that's what you're getting. I, I, again, I'm not the, that's what they're showing you guys. <laughs> Maybe you guys know better. That's that, that's wrong. But you should, that's what they've got. And so I guess if you if if they do the similar thing for the school construction, maybe you'll be able to get 20% of your your application. You know, I'm see what I'm saying. They don't show that because it's a grant program. You got to apply for it. So they don't say who's getting what in that. Anyhow, that's it, it's kind of interesting. So so. Uh, I wanted to show you a slide. You know, I talked about there's probably three billion dollars plus, maybe four billion available to be appropriated new general fund money this session. That's a lot of money. I would say three to four billion, counting that 900 million of reserve. I mean, of, of surplus that hasn't been reserved. They say it was reserved, but remember, the governor reserved 400 million for tax cuts, which the general assembly can completely ignore and reserve about 500 million for um, a super deposit because they had such a large surplus. There's a requirement that the governor propose a sur uh, super deposit in his introduced budget that the General Assembly can completely ignore, which they did ignore last year. So again, 
that is available money to be spent however they want to, the General Assembly. Now, you know the governor's going to, because he said, he's reserved 400 million, you know he's going to put a proposal in to cut taxes. Don't know what the General Assembly's going to do. So, you know there's going to be a big debate about tax policy. But there is 900 million plus the extra revenues, that two to three, there's really three to four billion available to be spent. So, here's what I put out as major gaps in statewide K-12 funding. First one is instructional aids. There is 21,000 plus instructional aids with an average salary of 22,000 or so dollars per, so they're relatively cheap, the instructional aids. They don't have to have the same credentials. The S standards of quality only funds 2,800 of them, basically for some kindergarten aids and special ed aids. This, these instructional aids are spread throughout the school districts, all the way through high school, middle school, high school, you know, first, second, third grade, they need them, and then you guys hire them. So I looked at uh, your combined school district, you have 227 aids, the last data I could see, and paid an average of 19,000, you only got funding for 24 of them. So guess what, you're paying 100% of the rest. You're getting your LCI, share for those 24, which is nothing. So you're basically paying those aides on your own, okay, with no state help. And that's, that's a, throughout the state. So, you know, people have focused on the, the support cap, and there's other things, you know, they don't cover all the teachers very soon. Well, this is over $400 million a year that localities are paying without any state help. It's the big, to me, it's the biggest single sort of uncovered area of school costs for localities that are not, the state is not helping you with. Another fairly big one is, is principals, and that's been debated, and actually the, the um, State Board of Education has got a, you know, they've recommended increasing that. They never have touched a proposal or recommendation for instructional aids. That mystifies me, and I've been feeding them this now, I'm starting to feed those guys over there saying, why aren't you talking about that, instructional aids? They have talked about the assistant principals, same kind of deal though, you've got 26, they fund you eight, okay, out of 26. And assistant principals, I would think, are pretty important nowadays with the way schools have to be run. Okay, they, they have a lot of, they have a big job to do. So I'm sure <coughs> you probably know more than I do about that. But also a big one is the teacher supply gap. You know, JLARC just did a really good report, you should read about it in December, about the teacher gap and difficulty in getting teachers to school divisions. You know, and they talked about some of these things, the decline enrollment, the financial barriers to get teachers in, preparation programs, you know, finding ways to minimize burnout so they'll stay. But clearly with inflation, even though they did 5%, 5% raises the state, of course, you have to match that and you have to overmatch because they don't cover all the teachers, they don't cover all the instruction aid, they don't cover all the support positions. Back. So you gotta do 100% of that raise. But we know inflation has been more than 5%. So I think they're gonna to have to come back again and boost those 5% raises at the state level. And so that's another area where they may have to spend some of that money. Um, and there, there's the support cap. Remember I said only a third of it's been eliminated? Well, they gotta put 270 million more into that. And um, that's per year, by the way. I should have noted that, 270, that's per year. And then the cool school construction, I mentioned that. So that's sort of my take on some of the major gaps that the state really should take a look at in terms of additional support out of that extra money that they have and, and you guys out in the localities can help them with those decisions by letting them know you know what your needs are so um, you know we've talked about everything you know the, the, your revenue growth compared to population inflation your, your property tax rates and where they, they lie and your real estate values your LCIs they're higher than than the surrounding uh, localities are and Why they're, why they're coming down a little bit the last 10 years. I've talked about that. You're still in that top tier exceeding your local match. Um, not sure about your teacher salaries. Uh, didn't really get into that too much. But free lunch students, disabled students, homeless, you know, gave you a little statistics on that. And then we just had a big discussion on state funding. So, and what the possibilities are there. Um, the state's in good financial shape. Maybe they'll provide some more support to you. I have to answer any questions. I hope that helped a little bit about um, kind of seeing what's going on. 
Thank okay. you, Mr. Reginball. Uh, I know that uh, we're under some pretty tight time constraints. Uh, some members uh, need to get out by 10, 10.30. So if we have any questions, we can ask Mr. Reginball. Ms. Ms. Larson. Thank you. Thank you very much. I always find your presentation <coughs> so interesting. Um, as my colleague in Rockingham likes to say, there is no state surplus as long as there's still bills that have not been paid. And there are many bills that have not been paid. So, but my question would be, do you see any movement? What do you think the chances are that we're going to get any assistance this go around from the state? And really, it looks like we need some help federally also with the numbers of um, dis, dis, special ed students. <coughs> but what, what do you see as the prospect for getting some help this session? You know, I would be really surprised if there wasn't some because because the two so, sort of, well, they're going to do more on, on mental health too, behavioral health. There'll be more done there um, because we're still trying to improve our mental health system. So that'll take some money. Uh, but I, I would be very surprised if there wasn't additional state support for K-12 because it, politically, that and tax policy are the two biggest issues that are always out there. So I would be surprised if they didn't do something. Thank you. Mr. McGuinness. Thank, thank you, Mr. Um, Jim, thanks very much for the presentation. It's all, as uh, Ruth indicated, it's uh, always very informative for us. Uh, I wonder if you have any insight into the question of whether the General Assembly is focused on providing a, um, a, an ongoing source of uh, revenue to replace the um, reduction in the funding from groceries. Um, well, you can see that they, they did use general funds um, for their portion, which was really a cut in the school age population distribution, uh, that's that's an appropriation you, anyhow, essentially, because it's in the budget. So they did put general funds. You have to assume they're going to keep doing that. They're not required to. Um, they haven't cut the one percent local option share. That's going to be one of the tax reduction proposals, probably on the plate this year. But what I'm hearing is they're not probably going to tackle that. That's, that's what I'm hearing. They're not. But I know there will be bills put in to do it. I guarantee you there will. But the leadership has sort of signaled, I thought, that they weren't going to touch that this year, and in particular in the Senate, which didn't go along with the last year. So if they cut that remaining 1% uh, the school for the, for the groceries, that's the local option that's remaining. That's it. The rest of it's been gotten rid of. So only, if you go to a grocery store and you buy food to take home, you pay 1% tax now. And that's the local option one. That's, they didn't touch that. That was part of the compromise last year. They, did, they didn't do it. You know, they, they wanted to. The, the governor and the Republicans wanted to cut that. But they compromised and didn't do it. And I, I think they'll probably leave that alone again this year. But it'll keep coming back. And so that's the one you want to be have a permanent solution to. You don't want to rely on a, an appropriation every year. So that's where you got to keep keep an eye on that. Right, but we have already lost the dedicated funding for the groceries and uh, for schools, right? And and so I'm really wondering whether there's any effort to sort of identify an additional ongoing source that we don't have to worry about every year being included in the in the um, negotiations. No, I, I don't think you're going to get that. I think that's going to be. I, I think that they've they've said they're going to replace that every year, you know, but remember, it's two-year budget. Mm -hmm. So you know, I, I told them last session, I, I threw VACO, and me and Katie Boy went over and talked to delegates about really just raising the share, you know, uh, that you get localities and, and make that part of the rate, not raising the overall rate, but taking some of the state's general fund that not unassigned, that's unassigned anything else moving that over to locality so that it becomes really permanent. But they didn't want to do it that way then. So I think that's the only way to do it. <coughs> take their unassigned portion, like two, it's about 2%. Take a little bit off that and move it over to the localities. So. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions for Mr. Reginball? There's a lot of information in a short time frame. But I just want to say thank you to, to you, sir, for always being available to us and providing your, your uh, expertise and fiscal insight uh, at these times when we're looking at our, our budgets, especially going into January uh, through April. So thank you, sir.
Thank you so much. We'll move on to uh, item 2-2, two, two, <coughs> our presentation of the superintendent's proposed fiscal year 24 through 33 capital improvement plan. Dr. Heron. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just prior to starting this morning, I do want to reemphasize a couple of things. Thank you very much, Mr. Regible, for the presentation as well. Two things stand out, and they're certainly in the uh, superintendent's legislative agenda for this year. Support cap, instructional aids, and teacher salaries. So if there's anything that we can reach out to our representatives to ask about with regard to school funding in the next year, those are two major things that will impact our, our schools moving forward. Good morning, uh, Mayor Pons and City Council, Council members, Chair McLennan, Board of Supervisors, and School Board members. Thank you for the opportunity to present the Superintendent's proposed Capital Improvement Plan for fiscal year 24 through 33. This morning, Ms. Ewing, Chief Financial Officer, will present not only the proposed plan, but provide context and background for the recommendations, including a brief overview of enrollment projections and current capacity of schools. We are very excited about bouncing back to almost pre-pandemic enrollment, adding 290 students with 141 at the elementary level. But with that comes the, the need to plan thoughtfully for the future space needs as a school division. Currently, we have trailers at all elementary schools except Matoka, 12 in total with three at Stonehouse. That's a total of 24 classrooms serving over 450 students daily. Two more temporary classrooms will be added to Stonehouse next year to maintain class size ratios. We have an RFP in process with the county for the design of pre-K space designed to serve 500 students. We are in the design process for the renovation of the 900 building at Lafayette High School, which will provide additional space at the high school level. With additional classrooms at La Lafayette High School, we will be just below 90% capacity at the high school level. New items in the capital plan include bus replacements, safety and security enhancements, and storm drain repairs. At this point, I I'm pleased to hand over to Ms. Ewan, who will take us through the presentation that focuses mainly on fiscal year 2024. Thank you, Ms. Ewan. Thank you, Dr. Heron. Good morning, everyone. Each year, the school division adopts a 10-year capital improvement plan to project and plan for future needs and to allow for adequate time and opportunity to prepare and budget for those needs. This morning, we will be sharing with you a summary of the superintendent's proposed <coughs> capital improvement plan for fiscal years 24 through 28, which is the first five years of the proposed 10-year capital improvement plan. The estimates for projects in the capital improvement plan include 10% for A&E, 5% for contingency, and the cost estimates within the five years have been adjusted by 6% due to the current volatile market. A new project may appear in the CIP for the first time due to new or updated information, for example, updated enrollment projections or projects needed for safety reasons. Our September 30th, 2021 enrollment was 11,018. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 10,892 to a high of 11,166. We actually ended up over the high projection for this year at 11,308. An overall increase of 290 students as compared to last year. In 2018, guidelines to address additional school capacity were established and agreed upon by the School Board, Board of Supervisors, and City Council. These guidelines established that at 85% capacity, an evaluation of needs and potential solutions would be developed, and at 90%, a recommendation for action would be presented. These guidelines were based on utilizing the low enrollment projection but it was agreed that annually it would be reviewed to determine if a more aggressive approach was necessary. Our enrollment is still recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic and has been over the high projection now for two years in a row. So the information that we are presenting will be based on the moderate projection. While Ms. Healy with FutureThink recommends utilizing the most likely for planning purposes, we are choosing to go with a more conservative method. We utilized the moderate projection the last two years for planning purposes and are continuing to do so this year. 
This slide shows a comparison of our high school enrollment. On September 30th, 2021, enrollment was 3,708. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 3,650 to a high of 3,741. We actually ended up over the high projection for this year at 3,770, an overall increase of 62 high school students as compared to last year. This table shows Future Think's moderate projected enrollment as it compares to the division's capacity for high schools. Overall, high school capacity is currently at 95% for the current year and is expected to continue increasing each year. Currently, the design for the renovation at Lafayette is underway with construction funding expected in fiscal year 24. The renovation at Lafayette <coughs> will add an additional 200 to 250 seats of capacity, which will bring overall high school capacity down to 90% or less. Due to the various programs that high school students have available to them, such as New Horizons and Governor's School, all students do not spend their entire day within the high schools. So we have placed the classroom expansions at Jamestown and Warhill in fiscal years 29 and 30, just outside of the five-year plan. We will continue reviewing this each year. This slide shows a comparison of our middle school enrollment. On September 30th, 2021, enrollment was 2,585. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 2,571 to a high of 2,638. We ended up over the high projection for this year at 2,665 an overall increase of 80 middle school students as compared to last year. This table shows Future Think's moderate projected enrollment as it compares to the division's capacity for middle schools. Overall, middle school capacity is currently at 85.2% and will reach 90% in fiscal year 29. Based on the projected middle school enrollment reaching the 90% capacity overall where action needs to be taken, phase two of James Blair has been placed in the CIP plan in fiscal year 32. While enrollment shows that we reach 90% capacity in fiscal year 29, a new central office will be needed prior to moving forward with phase two of James Blair. Currently, a new central office is in the CIP plan in fiscal years 30 and 31. We will continue monitoring each year as updated enrollment information is available. This slide shows a comparison of our elementary school enrollment. Our September 30th, 2021 enrollment was 4,725. And based on this, our projection for this school year ranged from a low of 4,671 to a high of 4,787. We actually ended up over the high projection for this year at 4,873, an overall increase of 148 elementary school students as compared to last year. Effective capacity is defined as the realistic and practical number of students that the school facility can house as per this formula. Effective capacity can vary somewhat each year depending on the number of classrooms, grade levels being served, and the special education population being served at each school site. If a school is over 90% capacity, there is no dedicated space for intervention services. That is why 90% is significant when making a decision to add space to serve all students. Once capacity of a school building gets beyond 90%, these services start taking place in makeshift spaces in hallways, closets, and other shared spaces. This table shows the elementary moderate projected enrollment with pre-K added. Overall, we are currently at 93.5% capacity. Norge and Matthew Whaley are at 96% capacity and Stonehouse is at 104% capacity. All elementary schools have trailers except for Matoka to assist with space needs. Trailers are not reflected in the effective capacity in this table as they are a short-term solution to address space needs. Overall, the division will be at 96% capacity in fiscal year 25 and is expected to increase each year to 100% in fiscal year 27. 
Funds for design of pre-K space were appropriated in fiscal year 22 by the localities with construction funding expected to be funded in fiscal year 24. Based on this timeline, there would be dedicated pre-K centers beginning in fiscal year 26, which would free up space within the elementary schools. This table reflects updated capacity for the elementary schools with the current pre-K classrooms being utilized beginning in fiscal year 26 for a K-2 class, which would accommodate 20 students per classroom. Comparing this new capacity with the moderate elementary projection from this year, you can see that our elementary schools <coughs> would be at an overall capacity in fiscal year 27 of just over 90% and continues to increase each year. Four of our schools would be over 100% capacity in fiscal year 26 when the pre-K centers would open. FutureThink recommends that we use these projections. This chart shows the most likely projection beginning in fiscal year 26 when the pre-K centers would open. Overall, we would be just under 90% capacity, increasing slightly <coughs> each year, reaching 95% in fiscal year 32. Last year and this year, as stated previously, we exceeded the high projection. This chart shows the high projection beginning in fiscal year 26 when the pre-K centers would open. Overall, we would be at 91% capacity, increasing each year, reaching 95% in fiscal year 29. Based on these projected elementary enrollment numbers, we have included design and construction of the 10th elementary school in fiscal years 27 and 28 of the plan. The total estimated cost based on current market conditions and escalated to the appropriate year is 66 million. This cost includes design, construction, testing and permitting fees, construction management, technology, furnishings, fixtures and equipment, as well as contingency funds. This estimated cost does not include land acquisition cost. There are several modifications that are being proposed in fiscal year 24 as compared to the current adopted plan. The first is moving up the renovation of the Jamestown weight room from fiscal year 28 to fiscal year 24 to address the inequity between the three high schools. Jamestown has the smallest weight room of the three schools, and this project will renovate and repurpose the space, creating more usable space for students. The estimated cost is $130,000. The Virginia Department of Education updated their playground space <coughs> guidelines in 2021, recommending that elementary schools with more than 400 students have at least 24,000 square feet of space in total. Six of our schools have less than this recommended amount, so we have increased the playground line and the CIP by 100,000 in the first five years of the plan so that we can begin to address this need. There is currently a project in fiscal year 26 to address this need at Stonehouse. Additionally, funds are needed to address the inclusivity and accessibility for all students on our playgrounds. We have added an additional 100,000 for this need. These adjustments will increase the playground line from 100,000 to 300,000 beginning in fiscal years 24 and going through fiscal year 28. In February 2022, members of our operations team met with the County Stormwater and Resource Protection Division to discuss results of a school storm drainage assessment. The assessment was initiated by James City County and conducted by PRISM engineers and contractors. The results showed that there is a significant need for storm drainage repairs. We have added 300,000 annually beginning in fiscal year 24 into the plan so that we can begin to address these necessary repairs. In consultation with the county and city finance directors, we agreed to begin including school bus replacements into the CIP beginning in fiscal year 24. By having them as part of the CIP, they will be planned for each year. In addition, the new agreement between the localities for the joint operation of the school division no longer allows for an end of year spending plan, which is how we have been maintaining our smoothing replacement plan for many years. 
Any surplus funds at the end of each fiscal year will support our CIP in the following and future years. The cost for fiscal year 24 is estimated to be 1.35 million. During fiscal year 22, the division had a threat and vulnerability assessment completed. As part of the assessment, specific recommendations to enhance the safety and security of the division's facilities were provided. Initial funding was requested as part of our year-end spending plan request this year, but we will need a continuous stream of funding to be able to address all of the recommendations. We have proposed 300,000 beginning in fiscal year 24 with a total amount over the 10 years of 2.65 million. All of the estimated costs for projects within the five-year plan have been increased by 6% based on current market conditions. There are a few projects that we've received estimates on that have more significant cost increases as outlined here. Most notable is the cost of the construction of the pre-K centers. Based on the request from the James City County Board of Supervisors, we worked with RRMM to determine if two 252 student sites would be feasible, and the cost is estimated to be 39.7 million. <coughs> While we had originally requested 33 million for the construction of pre-K space, the adopted plan of the localities allocated 25 million to this project. We have also received updated estimates for the construction of the Jamestown cafeteria expansion and the 900 building renovation at Lafayette. The total increase for these projects as compared to last year is 2.3 million. We have received funding through our state school construction grant entitlement that was part of the General Assembly's budget this year that we anticipate utilizing towards the Lafayette renovation. This will cover approximately 3.9 million of the cost of the project. Here you'll see the additions to the plan not previously discussed. Additional school buses have been ad are added when new facilities are built with the construction of the pre-K space in fiscal year 24. Funds for additional buses are included in fiscal years 26 and 27 to accommodate the growth in the program of 100 students. These are specialized buses that accommodate 15 students per bus with car seats. Based on our established refurbishment and replacement cycles, interior repainting and carpet replacement at James River, Matthew Whaley, Norge, and Stonehouse are included in fiscal year 33. And there's also the addition of fire panel replacements in fiscal years 29 through 32. The CIP document presents projects by school. This pie graph shows the breakdown by type of project. HVAC and window projects account for 12.2% of the total five-year CIP, or 20.2 million. Refurbishments, roof replacements, and other repairs account for 5.3% of the total five-year CIP, or 8.8 .8 million. Other projects include things such as refrigerator, freezer replacements, generators, and school bus replacements account for 13%, or 21.4 million and new facilities account for 69.5% or 114.8 million of the total five-year CIP. The superintendent's recommended five-year plan totals $165,246,000. $3.9 of the total will be funded through our state school construction grant. And this concludes our presentation and we'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. I wanted to say thank you to you, Ms. Ewing and Mr. Kiever, for your diligent work over the last several months putting the CIP together for us in the presentation. Do we have questions for Ms. Ewing or Dr. Heron? None at all. Mr. Town, I, I yes, don't uh, have a, a question, but I, I did just want to indicate that uh, at uh, an earlier meeting of school liaison committee, the uh, um, uh, as representatives of the county, uh, uh, we did express an expectation that we would continue to operate under the low enrollment uh, projections uh, uh, in terms of consideration of our CIP recommendations. Uh, uh, just wanted to make it clear, based on the fact that we are still kind of catching up to the uh, pre-COVID uh, uh, enrollment numbers in schools and not seeing a significant increase in live births in the community. Thank you, Chairman McGuinness. 
A question here. Yes, sir. Uh, so on transportation, uh, could we have a quick update on, have we started the use of electric buses and what's, what are we finding out in terms of their range compared to what we thought that was gonna be? And then also we had heard, uh, I guess a year or two ago about using smaller vans to uh, supplement the, the bus driver shortage issue. And, and what's the status of that, that program? I'm going to ha pass that question to Mr. Kiever this morning, just for a very brief uh, response, as it's not actually connected to the CIP. Sure. Good morning. Uh, we are utilizing ele electric buses. Uh, we're finding um, some challenges with charging. We're finding some challenges with being able to sustain uh, the routes that we have to be serviced uh, via the electric buses. We continue to, to want it to work uh, and are, are doing the best we can. Uh, just not sure right now that the technology is where it needs to be to serve a, a school division with the geography that we have. Uh, on the question around uh, some smaller vehicles to transport students, uh, in general, we are finding it difficult to hire staff to, to drive buses. Uh, we're also finding it difficult to hire staff to, to be what we have called specialty drivers. We do have some. Uh, however, it, it, it is not taken off the way we had uh, hoped. Thank you. So, so I think, uh, so you built the CIP based on a moderate growth in enrollment, is that what I understand? That's correct, sir. And so with the statement that Dr. McLennan just made about the, the low in projection, does that affect the CIP much or? I think it would slow down and change our whole ask in terms of space. Um, the reason we use moderate is we feel it's a very conservative approach. Um, Future Think recommends using most likely because we have been over high projection for two years. If we use low projection, that would assume we would have only 85 more students at elementary next year. We've had 141 and 148 over the last two years and we're still coming back from the pandemic. Low projection assumes 194 only over 10 years. We've had 141 last year, 148 this year. We really feel in planning and looking forward, we should be using moderate projection. Thank you. Uh, question. Um, with, the, with those projections, that's two years. What have we done in the last 10 years prior to that? Were we at the low projection? I think, I think we were in the last 10 years at low. So it might be just an influx for the two years. And, you know, James City County being 90% of the um, holder here as far as the funds, I will have to adjust this in our budget session sure. because there's other things that we have as, as going on that. I might as well put the elephant out in the room, we're not gonna make this. You know, there, there's some things that are gonna definitely have to be adjusted. I'll leave that to the county administrator to lead us in that process as we go through our budget and all that. But I don't want it to um, go out in the general public that this is what we're going to do. This is what you need or you're asking for, for the moderate instead of low. But this is what, as of right now, the school sees that their needs are and then we'll have to go back with city council and and decide okay these are the items that we can or can't pay for we may have to put out to future years understand completely sir i think part of the the document and purpose is really to plan forward for the future and things could adjust within the next year um, but i think from a school division's perspective we've got to plan because of the numbers that we've had in the last two years. For many years, we used most likely. That was what we always used. Then because of very slow growth, we did use low projections for two years, and that's when we made the agreement with an 85 and 90%. For the last two years, we've actually used moderate. And based on the fact we're over high again this year, we were using moderate this year again. Future Think said to use most likely but we felt that was too aggressive in, in, in an approach. Um, so we're just thinking ahead and really trying to, to look to bring all of our students currently in trailers back into the buildings. And that's one of our main objectives in looking forward. And I know when um, our chairman came back to us and told us that you know, 
everyone had met and we had agreed on low and now we're seeing we're not using low it just gives me some concern of why this wasn't put together as low instead of what it's put together so that that's a little concerning to me as far as where where we're going as a team yeah i understand completely i think the the agreement did say low but did say we we would revisit it every single year depending on circumstances we've been in a very unusual climate where we lost over 500 students and most of them are back we've got probably one more year we think of more than normal coming back and then at that point i think we'll be able to really look at it into the future and uh, determine what to use um, but from a planning you know based on future things recommendation we felt we really had to put this out for discussion this morning as as our real needs thank you mayor Bones. Yeah, follow up on the projection um, so we've experienced high growth over the last two years but and that is that is there a correlation to what we've lost due to people being pulled out of the schools during the pandemic and and have we seen that those numbers come back and is that having the students come back having been pulled out is that what created the high growth yeah i think it certainly is partially drew, due to that because most of our students have come back we have a significant turnover within our school division every year with school students leaving the area and others coming in but I, I do think a significant part of the bounce back are, would be students returning to schools. But the, your, your point about getting students back into the schools from the trailers, I think, um, is something that we aspire to, to see happen, because I, I think, and I don't know, I'm not the expert, but that is a better